All right, good morning, everyone. Um, you guys still hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, my name is Tony Burns. I am from Capital One. And today I want to talk a little bit about continuous delivery on Amazon's EC2 container service. Um, so just a little bit about myself. Um, so I'm from Capital One. Uh, I've been doing DevOps at Capital One since 2015. Um, before that, I started my career as a Ruby on Rails developer in the DC startup world. Um, as part of that, I ended up co-authoring a book called Deploying Rails back in 2011, which um, incidentally was out of date about a week after it got published. Um, <laughs> but uh, that was kind of what started my love for all things DevOps, continuous delivery, and so I've just been rolling with it ever since then. Um, at Capital One right now, I'm currently working on an internal CI/CD tooling platform that we just decided to name Roswell recently. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about that today. And um, otherwise, I'm going to talk about how we do CI/CD for our ECS clusters, as well as our microservices that are deployed on those clusters. So um, diving right in, does anyone here not know what Docker is? All right, good, so I can probably just skip this slide then. Um, so uh, as far as Amazon EC2 container service goes, I'll talk about this one anyway. Um, ECS is Amazon's orchestration layer that's AWS native um, for Docker containers running on clusters of EC2 instances. And so it handles things like scheduling and resource management for um, Docker clusters and um, the containers that are running on them. And it's in the same space as other tools like Docker Swarm, Kubernetes, Mesos, you may have heard of, of those. Um, I'm not going to go, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go too far into why we chose ECS um, versus any of those other tools. I'd be happy to talk about it afterwards with anyone who's interested. Um, but uh, we chose ECS as the orchestration layer of choice for our microservices, at least in my group in Capital One. There's like tens of thousands of us, so other people are doing other things, but uh, we chose ECS. And um, so before I start talking about our pipelines, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we organize our code bases to support those pipelines. And so the first tenet there is everything in code and um, everything in one place. And by one place, I mean all of your infrastructure, all of your application code, all of your tests go into one repository. Um, and so we have two types of repositories here. We have our cluster repositories, which obviously handle the infrastructure and the pipelines for our ECS clusters themselves. And then we have our application repositories. And I'll go over a few of the differences here with how we set these up and some of the whys. Um, so repositories for ECS clusters. Um, what we have in there is our cloud formation templates, our uh, deployment configuration, as well as our infrastructure tests for those clusters. Um, and so first thing, our cloud formation templates. Um, we have kind of a conventional way that we've set up our cloud formation templates for immutable deployments of auto scaling groups for the clusters. And so obviously things like your ECS cluster itself, um, SNS topics and things like that, you don't want those to get redeployed in an immutable deployment every time um, you do a release. And uh, so we keep those in a separate template in a separate stack that persists across deployments. Um, our other template that we have uh, just has the auto scaling group and the launch configuration um, for that release. And as far as config management inside of those auto scaling groups, um, we currently use Chef Zero. Um, so for our deployment configuration, this is where that tool I mentioned called Roswell comes in. Uh, what we developed over the last couple of years was a tool to orchestrate um, at first formation based blue-green deployments. And so this tool handles a lot of different things um, that I'll touch on in the rest of the presentation. Um, but the, the central part of this tool is a YAML file that lives in your repository. And this YAML file has all of your environment configuration for each one of your different environments. So essentially the, 
cloud formation stacks in those environments. So things like um, parameters and, and tags and things like that. Um, we've built a few different uh, niceties into this. So one thing, you know how I mentioned that we have those two separate templates? Well, how do we get the cluster name uh, for the ECS cluster that we deployed and the persistent template into each release stack? And so um, CloudFormation released this thing to do um, output value pulling inside of CloudFormation templates a while back, but that didn't work out for us because um, those names have to be unique across the entire region. And so what we built inside of this um, deployment configuration was a very lightweight DSL that allows us to do things like pull the output from one stack and plug it into a parameter in another stack, as well as a lot of things like environment variable injection um, for the pipelines to, to actually tell it like what um, what the stack name should be and things like that. Um, and then our infrastructure tests. Um, so we do infrastructure testing for the ECS clusters at a couple different levels. So as I mentioned, we use Chef Zero on the auto scaling groups to actually bring up things like Docker and the ECS agent. Um, at the end of the Chef run, we run a inspect suite that um, tests things like is Docker up and running? Is the ECS agent up and running? And that, um, that test suite actually goes back and informs via CloudFormation signaling um, whether or not the stack came up successfully. Um, at another level, when we, whenever we deploy the cluster, our, our integration tests for the cluster are actually a Cucumber um, test suite that goes and creates a task on the cluster and that really tells us you know, 100% um, this container instance or this cluster release is up and running. And so moving on to our application repositories, um, you know, these are laid out very similarly. So we have our cloud formation templates, our deployment configuration, and then of course our application code and our application tests. Um, so cloud formation templates for ECS applications, um, very similar convention. We have our template that creates a stack that persists across deployments, uh, things like your load balancer, your uh, Route 53 records, SNS topic, anything that you wouldn't want to go away um, during a blue-green deployment. And then our immutable stack, instead of an auto-scaling group and a launch configuration, that contains an ECS service and task definition. Um, so for our deployment configuration, um, same YAML files I talked about before. In this case, for ECS applications, the parameters are just slightly different. So you have things like um, security group IDs for your load balancer. And one thing that we built into um, this tool is the ability to break that out further into what the parameter values should be for um, each region that you're deploying into, since those are different for things like security groups and subnets. And then you have your application code. So most of our applications right now are written in um, Spring Boot, um, and our tests are written in Cucumber. Uh, with the JVM runtime behind it. And so continuing with, um, you know, everything is code, um, everything in one place. Um, talk about our pipelines now. So our pipelines are codified as well. Historically, we used the Jenkins job DSL plugin, which uses um, Groovy scripts and a DSL inside of those scripts that's written in Groovy to provision all of your jobs um, for your pipeline. And Right now we're moving um, to the Jenkins 2.0, um, Jenkins file declarative pipelines. And, you know, so roughly like that, um, but with everything else filled in. And the, the Roswell tool that we use, I'll talk about this uh, when I talk about deployment, uh, is handling a lot of the individual steps that go into each of these stages. Um, and so moving into what our actual pipelines are, we, we follow kind of a modified Git flow um, branching strategy um, that's mirrored into our pipelines. And um, instead of calling it develop, we call it integration, but it's the same thing. Um, and so we have two types of development pipelines. We have our integration pull request pipeline, which runs every time someone commits to a pull, uh, pushes commits to a pull request or opens a new one, and then we have our integration push pipeline, which happens every time you merge to the integration branch. And then uh, that lines up with our 
integration testing environment deploy. And so drilling down into each one of these, um, as I said, the integration pull request pipeline, this kicks off whenever a developer pushes to a pull request, so creates or updates one um, that's against the integration branch. Um, once the pipeline starts, you run through your typical commit phase. So in the case of an ECS application, that's going to be you know, your Maven build, your Docker build, and then that's also when we push those artifacts up to the repositories that we use. So that's a combination of S3, an um, internal Docker registry that we have, as well as Artifactory for, um, for some of the Java stuff. Um, and then we deploy our testing environment. So our testing environment for integration pull requests is deployed the same way that every other environment is deployed to um, with regards to how the Roswell tool deploys the stacks, uses, utilizes the same CloudFormation templates, um, uses that deploy.yaml configuration file for Roswell. Um, and this gives us a, a pretty close environment that we can test against even inside of pull requests. Um, and so once that testing environment is up and running, the endpoint for that environment is injected into the component test suite, um, which then runs and um, talks back to GitHub Enterprise to tell whether or not the pull request was successful. Um, whether that passes or fails, uh, we destroy that testing environment afterwards, because obviously if you're in a fast feedback loop like this and you know, people are pushing commits to pull requests all the time, you don't want hundreds of CloudFormation stacks piling up in your AWS account. Um, so once a pull request actually gets merged to the integration branch, um, you know, reviewer merges the pull request, we build the artifact, um, we upload it to uh, Docker registry, Artifactory, and whatnot. Uh, and then we start a blue-green deploy of the QA environment. And I'll, I'll go further into how we actually do the blue-green deploys after I talk about the pipelines here. Um, but after that deploy starts, um, we run the integration tests against that new release inside of the integration environment. Um, again, this is Cucumber Test Suite, so that, um, and this is a fixed environment, so this one doesn't go away. And after we run those integration tests, we finish doing the blue-green deploy. And this is basically the, the feedback loop that you have on your integration branch constantly as pull requests get merged. Um, so moving on to our release pipelines, and this is where things get a little um, specific to how we had to do things as a bank. So in, in banking, we have all these regulations where you know, it, it pretty much prevents us from doing true continuous deployment um, because there has, to be, there has to be gates in there. Um, now, before we had all of this set up, those gates involved weeks of approval committees and like 10 different people from different parts of the organization having to sign off on your release. And then it was batched up with 100 other applications at, at midnight sometime, and it usually failed. Um, so we brought that down. With this and a release management tool that we built internally um, to just one gate. And so now, um, instead of taking weeks, our deployments um, take hours. Um, and what we use as the approval gate there is the product owner for the team um, who owns the code. And, and this, does, this does a really good thing by bringing in that product owner and really giving them a stake in the releases that are going out. And so for our release pipelines, um, a developer still is the one who initiates a release candidate. And they initiate a release candidate simply by creating a branch called release off of integration at whatever point they want to release and um, pull requesting that to master. And so that kicks off the release candidate pipeline. Uh, once approval is received from our release management system, um, the production release pipeline runs. And so drilling down into these guys, the release candidate pipeline, once that pull request gets opened or if it gets updated, um, we build the artifact and upload. So same commit phase again. Um, same type of blue-green deploy, this time to a long-running regression environment that we have. Um, we run our regression tests, and then we finish the deploy. Um, now the difference here 
is after we finish deploying that regression environment, after the regression tests run, um, we kick off a release request over to that release management system for approval by the product owner. Um, and all they have to do then is hit approve in an email and um, the production release pipeline kicks off. And so for our production release pipeline, we don't actually rebuild the artifact in this case. We promote it um, inside of those repositories. So whether they're, it's the Docker registry or, um, or S3 or artifact, we, we promote the artifact. Um, and then we start a blue-green deploy of the production environment. Um, after the production environment um, blue-green deploy starts, we run our smoke tests, finish deploying the production environment, and then that pull request from the release branch to master automatically gets approved, uh, sorry, automatically gets merged into master for you. Um, so it's pretty much hands off from the time that you actually, as a developer, submit that pull request for release. Um, we also do a couple other things like bump the version and then talk back to that release management system to say that um, the release has been completed. And so now going into how we actually do those blue-green deploys, um, so for ECS clusters, we have a few requirements here. Um, one of the big requirements is that uh, we have zero downtime for any services that are running on that uh, cluster. And you know, at the same time when you're deploying the cluster, it should not, it should not bring down anything that's already running on it, um, shouldn't even notice it as a service that's on the cluster. Um, another requirement is, as I've touched on already, the same deployment across all environments. Um, we want to have a high degree of confidence, not only in our code base, um, but also our pipelines and our um, release process and our deployments. Um, parallel deployment to multiple regions. So we have multi-region resiliency requirements for these, uh, for these microservices, as well as the clusters that they're running on. Um, so we, we fulfill that by uh, deploying simultaneously to both east and west whenever we do a deploy. And then we need bulletproof rollback if any sort of validation inside of the cluster deployment fails. You don't want um, some sort of failure in the cluster deployment itself impacting those services that are running on it. Um, the way that we've achieved this is all around this concept called draining that um, thankfully AWS released into the ECS API right when we were building all this orchestration. And um, what draining is, is you can talk to an AWS, uh, you can talk to the ECS API and tell it for this container instance, uh, which is EC2 instance, drain all of the tasks that are running on that instance. And so by telling it to do that, ECS actually takes care of it for you um, to drain connections on those tasks and then move those over to a free instance um, that's inside of the cluster. And so how we do this is the first step is creating a new container instance stack. So we create the new container instance stack um, uh, with the uh, new infrastructure, new release, new artifacts that are coming down, and we wait for that to join the ECS cluster. Um, once that joins the ECS cluster, we set all of those old container instances to draining from the old auto-scaling group. Um, these are all things that this Roswell tool um, facilitates. So uh, originally we built Roswell in order to just deploy standard services via auto-scaling groups. Um, what we ended up building inside of Roswell once we got to this point is we needed hooks. So once, once a stack deploys successfully allow us to write some code into a rake file that does some stuff afterwards. And so we added a hook system um, to our deployment tool so that it could facilitate things like this. Um, and so we drain the old container instances and one thing that the ECS API doesn't provide for you, um, because it's really going to be specific to your use case, is you know, validating that those tasks actually move to the new container instances. And so um, we do this in a few different ways, um, because we need to wait for all of the services to move to the new container instances before we can complete the deployment and destroy the old auto-scaling group. Um, and so a few ways that we do this, first of all, uh, just some simple arithmetic. So we check that there's no tasks running on the old container instances. Um, and that tells, us, uh, that tells us part of the story, but we want to check the positive side of that too. 
And so we also check that the desired count for each service that was running on that cluster is now still equal to the number of tasks that are actually running on the cluster. Um, and, that, and that continues to tell part of the story, but if, you, if you've worked with ECS, um, you'll know that um, just because a task says it's running doesn't mean it's actually running. It could actually be flapping on startup uh, or something like that. And so to complete the validation, we check that all the services are actually healthy on their load balancers. And that, and that really tells us 100% at this point that all the services moved to the new container instances and we're ready to go to complete the deploy. Um, and so to complete the deploy, we deregister the old container instances. Um, and then we delete that stack. Now what happens if your tests fail or the services aren't coming up on the new container instances or the new container instances failed to deploy because a couple of them had chef run failures or something like that. Well, in that case, we roll back to our blue stack. And so to do this, we pretty much follow the deployment process in reverse. So we drain the new container instance stack. We activate the old container instances. Once that happens, we wait for anything to move over that needs to move over to um, back to the old container instances. And, and that's the same process that we use there. Um, and then we deregister the new container instances and delete the new container instance stack. And so that's pretty much it in a nutshell for the ECS cluster deployment. Um, and this process is what allows us to really completely decouple the ECS cluster from the applications that are running on it. Because we really want to treat the ECS cluster infrastructure itself as kind of a COTS application. So for deploying our services, um, you know, our requirements are pretty much the same here. Um, we want zero downtime, blue-green deployment for any service deployments in our QA, our production, our regression environments. Um, we want the same deployment across all of our environments, again, to give us a high degree of confidence in um, you know, not only our code base, but also our pipelines and our deployment process. And um, as far as our services go, uh, we also deploy these in parallel to both regions that we're in. Um, and for the most part, our services are active-active across both of those regions. Um, so through a combination of Route 53 and, and various other things, um, that all works as expected. Um, and we want bulletproof rollback if the deployment of the services or any of their test suites fail. And so to do this for our ECS services, um, it's, it's pretty similar to our cluster deployment. So um, creating a new service stack, um, and that will run alongside the old service stack basically until we validate that it is up and running. Um, and so validation in that case is just checking desired counts on that service, checking, um, checking that the tasks are hooked up to the load balancer and things like that. Um, and this is how we validate the new service healthiness. Um, load balancer healthiness is, you know, in service equals the desired count on the, on the service. Um, task healthiness is, you know, the number of tasks running equal the number that you want on the service. Uh, and these are all things that we encapsulated into actions inside of this Roswell tool to make this kind of deployment pipeline uh, reusable across multiple teams. Um, after that, we disable the old service tasks. And I say disable here, not delete, because in the event of a rollback, you want to be able to quickly bring that old release back up. Um, so we do that by just setting the desired count to zero on those guys. And then um, we run our test suite, depending on what environment you're in. It could be the component tests, the integration tests, regression tests, or smoke tests for, for production. Um, and then we delete the old service stack. Again, all these things are, are things that we've encapsulated inside of this Roswell tool um, because we really wanted to make it easy for uh, multiple teams across the company uh, and just across our group to be able to spin these things up quickly and have a consistent deployment process across all of their applications. Um, so in the event of a test failure or a deployment failure in the um, in the service pipelines, uh, we roll back to blue. And so 
this is roughly the same again. We re-enable the old service test by just setting the desired count back up to what it originally was. Um, we let those come up and we validate the healthiness of those new tasks. Um, so again, checking the load balancer healthiness, checking the task healthiness. And then we delete the new service tasks. And um, that's pretty much it for service deployment. Um, one huge caveat here is that you don't want to deploy the cluster while apps are deploying or vice versa. Um, because of the validations that they're doing on things like the task counts and the service healthiness and things like that, um, everything pretty much blows up if you try to do both simultaneously. And um, so what we're doing now is we're actually working on a locking system um, so that um, one cannot happen while the other is happening. Um, so that's pretty much all I had. Um, thank you very much. Are there any questions? <laughs> so the question was, um, for a product owner approval, do we do it before or after? The, it, was it the regression test you're talking about? Or? Yeah, is it like before deployment or after deployment when you know it's good but not like live? Yeah, so it's after, after that regression um, testing deployment that happens um, during the release candidate pipeline. Um, after that, that's when the release candidate actually goes for approval to the product owner. Um, and so you know at that point that you know, all the tests have been run um, that you're going to have up to there. So this is a very good question. So the question was, do any of our applications have database migrations, and how do we handle that in our blue-green deployments? Um, that's actually not something that I have a ton of experience yet with, with these pipelines. I know there's groups that do. Uh, there are teams that are doing their migrations as part of their blue-greens. Um, in a lot of cases, we're dealing with legacy databases, though, that have a completely separate process. Like it's a big Oracle rack somewhere, and the DBAs have their own um, distinct process to, to do those deploys, so those are kind of decoupled from this. Um, once we start moving more towards um, things like applications having their own RDS instances and, and things like that, um, that use case will probably drive out some sort of functionality inside of the Roswell tool that we built um, to facilitate um, migrations as well. So the question was, how long does that integration pull request pipeline take to run? Um, you know, whenever a pull request is created or, or something gets pushed to a pull request. Um, so it's really application dependent. Um, I, I would say the minimum time with our applications is probably around five or six minutes. Um, so it's not too bad. It really depends on how much you're putting into that component testing suite um, and, you know, how long whatever you're running inside of the Docker container takes to start up. Um, so the the time it takes to actually spin up the infrastructure um, is, is really fast for ECS. Um, you know, the, the service comes up really quick, the tasks start running, and then at that point you're waiting on, uh, you know, whatever your Spring Boot application start time is, or, or then, you know, however long your test suite takes to run. All right, thanks again, everyone. Thank you.